Am I I'll start in the now, so I'll do the introduction in now then. If you would please, yeah. Right. Uh, right. Good evening and welcome to another CARS webinar. I just want to remind you that the deadline for reserving your place on the meeting on the 24th of August with Chris Lintot is the 21st of July. So if you have not done so, please do so before then. I also sent a block email out to everyone about Chris's book and the link to actually purchasing his book. But unfortunately, a couple of those emails got returned as um, the server of the people deemed them to be spam emails. So I'll, re I'll resend those in due course this week. Our next webinar is on the 27th of July when Roy Bryce will be talking about the history of Scottish geology. Our speaker this evening is Mary McIntyre from Oxfordshire. Mary has loved astronomy since she was a young child, a love that stemmed from her mum. Mary is also a keen astrophotographer and has had her images published in astronomy mags, astronomy books, local and national newspapers, and on various TV shows. She also loves sketching astronomical objects. She enjoys writing about astronomy and has had articles published in the sky at night and all about space mags and a couple of books. In March 2018, she was elected as a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society and is a member of the BAA and the SPA and the Society for the History of Astronomy. Mary also plays bass guitar and sings with local musicians. So please give Mary our usual warm Kaz welcome. Thank you. Okay Mary, I'll just make you the host now, okay? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, shall I mute everybody? Yeah. Aye, I think you'd be better. Yeah. yeah, I'll do that and then I'll take questions at the end, obviously. Um, if I'm not going to look at the chat while I'm doing the talk, but if anyone has questions and want to just put them there, then you don't forget, then um, just, yeah, that's fine. Um, put them there and I'll have a look at the end. I can't remember where the mute everyone button has gone. <clears throat> If you press the Alt key and the M key. Oh, that's it. It's a shortcut, isn't it? Alt M. Okay. Okay, so I'll share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you can see my laser pointer. So thank you for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to speak with you tonight. Um, one great thing that's come out of the whole COVID-19 situation is that I'm getting to talk to societies that are much further away than where I'm living. And that's really good for me because I would never have been able to drive to Scotland to do this for you. So I'm really glad that I'm able to give you this talk. Um, this talk is one that I've been rejigging over the last four years and it's been my most popular talk to date. And I'm basically going to go through how to create star trails from absolute beginning all the way through camera settings, how to stack the data, how to process the data. And then at the end, I'm going to go through how you can then turn that into a time lapse video. And I'm going to go through all of those steps, but there is also a PDF guide. So don't try and worry about writing everything down. You, it's all there in the notes with screenshots explaining how to use all the software. Um, I'm going to be showing you screenshots of exactly how to do everything. So it really is a beginning to end kind of thing. So this talk will overrun. It'll be about an hour and 15 minutes thereabouts. Um, I'll try not to make it overrun too much, but there's a lot of information here. One of the things I really love about Star Trails is that they can be achieved with really simple equipment. You don't need to have really fancy cameras or any fancy equipment to be able to do it. If you have a camera that can do a 15 second exposure, um, basically you can do Star Trails. 
and um, it, it's just dead dead simple and all the software that we use to do it is really simple as well so I'm going to go through all of that. Um, now as um, Alice Amanda said um, I do live in Oxfordshire this is our setup at home this is our observatory shed um, when we moved to this house we bought it because it's got a dark garden and we wanted an observatory shed both Mark and I have wanted an observatory since we were children and that was great and we were both using it, taking it in turns. Um, everyone who knows us know that we get a tiny bit competitive. And with astrophotography, there is definitely more than one way to achieve the same result. And Mark and I do not agree on how to do anything. So we literally cannot work together in the observatory shed. So we either have to take it in turns, which starts to cause domestics because I always think he's had it longer than me. So he built me my own pier. So underneath this pier, we have another telescope mount. It's just an EQ which I quite like it's not as high tech as what's in the observatory and I actually quite like the fact I've got to be outside to set it all up inside the shed is all computer powered this now has an Altair hypercam on it rather than a digital SLR and that just stays aligned at all times Mark does everything with plate solving and drives everything through planetarium software I'd love to learn how to do that, but every time I step near that laptop, it crashes. So he's never yet successfully shown me how to use the software that he uses to drive this telescope, which is really irritating because I love this little telescope. It's an eight inch Ritchie Crescent. But I mostly work with, this is my old Helios refractor down here. It was a hand-me-down that I've had for years. It's not very good for imaging, but it's fantastic for solar work with the filter on the front. And it's my favorite visual telescope. And if I'm ever sketching at the eyepiece, that's the telescope I'm usually using. Behind that, there is a 70 mil um, William Optics refractor, which is one of my favorite ones to use. As well as that, we've got a big 10 inch Dobsonian telescope in its own little shed that looks like a port loo from the outside, but it, it does have a telescope in it. And this is just some of the pictures that um, I've taken. I, I've been doing astrophotography for 10 years, so there's over 4,000 pictures on my Flickr stream, but these are some of the ones I think are amongst my best. Um, as well as the imaging side, we also have now four of these. These are um, Meteor cameras, which are linked into the UK Meteor Network, and these are constantly recording the sky for fireballs and just any meteor event really. So when it's constantly recording, if it detects movement, it saves the video, and then you can do actual science from that data. And um, the pictures from it are not the best because they're basically CCTV cameras, but it doesn't matter because it, the important thing is the science that you get out of those. And particularly if more than one station has caught the same event, you can then start triangulating and figure out a lot of very detailed information about the meteors. We also have an all sky camera that Mark built from kind of little bits, which is fantastic. And one of our meteor cameras and this all sky camera automatically upload time lapse videos to YouTube all by themselves. My husband's a coder, he can code in about 15 languages, so he likes doing this stuff for fun. So that his YouTube channel is all just basically Python code that does everything for him, whereas I tend to be there clicking buttons on mine. Um, as Alice said, I do like sketching. These are just some of my sketches. And I think it's important that as an astrophotographer that I still do this because I realized that I was spending no time at all actually observing. I was taking a picture, then putting the camera away, processing it to look like a pretty picture, but without actually studying what I'd taken a picture of. So I now quite often do sketch from photographs, but I also sketch at the eyepiece and... I love it. It really does make me feel connected to the objects that I'm looking at. And more recently, I started getting into acrylic um, space inspired fluid art. And basically, these are not of a particular um, object. They are just basically fluid acrylics that could be any generic nebula. And this is a sort of technique I'm really having a lot of fun with. Very messy, very free. Um, when you when I do a photorealistic sketch, every pencil stroke has to be accurate. But with this, you just pour it on the canvas and tilt it around. So really good fun. Um, you use a hairdryer, you can pour over all sorts of things. So I've been having great fun playing with that as well. 
So when I'm not doing that, as Ali said, I play bass guitar, although not at the moment because no music is happening. But we, I do still meet virtually with my guitar player quite regularly and hopefully we'll get back to music at some point. But tonight I'm going to talk you through Star Trails. And as I said, there is a summary PDF here, which I can email to somebody to circulate it to the group. It, you'll obviously have my email address when I forward that. If there's anything that doesn't make sense, please do just email me and ask or message me on Facebook. Um, I'm always happy to help if something I've written doesn't make any sense to you. And there's a lot of information in this talk tonight. So if it doesn't kind of click straight away, please do just email me. So this is um, a slightly out of date now picture of the general equipment that I've used for Star Trails photography. And my tripod is only a 12 pound tripod. It's not very fancy at all. The features that are useful is the fact that it's got a locking nut here and the handle there locks. So it will lock side to side and up and down. So it will keep the head of the tripod nice and still when you're kind of messing around and reviewing pictures. And what you can't see is that underneath there, there is actually a hook so you can hang something heavy on it to help weigh the tripod down. And I'll talk about why that's important a little bit later. I have three Canon 1100Ds and my husband has two Canon 1100Ds. I think these cameras breed when we sleep, but we both really like these cameras. They're one of the cheapest SLRs on the market. And I have done all my astrophotography with them. I now have um, a little ASI camera that I do a lot of lunar stuff with and some solar stuff, but pretty much everything else I do is done with one of these cameras. I have two standard and one astro modded just for star trails don't use the modded one because it'll make everything pink and it'll look really weird so it, it just won't help you this is the kit lens and the majority of my wide field stuff ha has been done with the kit lens that's because i didn't have a wider angle lens i do now have a proper 10 mil wide angle lens but one of the things i used to do is attach one of those fisheye attachments onto the front of the lens um, they're about 15, 20 pounds and you do get what you pay for with camera equipment. So they're not the best in terms of quality, but there are some features about those things that you can actually use to your advantage. That is feature that you don't want in any other sort of photography, but it, it can benefit you with this. So if you don't have a wide angle lens, but you want to get a wider angle for star trails, you absolutely can use one of those cheaper attachments. This is a 50 mil lens, which I have used for star trails as well. Uh, but generally I tend to go for as wide a field as possible and once I've done the wide field as long as the focus is good you can then crop it so I tend to go for the widest view that I have I always use a remote shutter cable mostly because that means I can just press this button and lock it in place and as long as your camera is set to continuous it would just keep taking the pictures one after the other so if I'm doing that from the garden it means I can then go inside and drink hot chocolate in the warm while my camera is doing all the work um, also a kind of makeshift dew heater um, I use an old sock and some reusable Poundland hand warmers and I'll show you how to do that in a second um, also, I'm not talking about smartphone star trails tonight because it's not something I've really done myself. But one of my friends who lives up in Scarborough area, Richard Lindley, has done these. There is um, an app called Star Trails, quite originally. Um, you can get that app for smartphones and it will take control of your smartphone camera and actually allow you to build a star trails picture actually within um, the phone itself there are some bridge cameras as well that have a star a compact cameras as well that have built-in star trails settings if you've got one of those that's great you just tell it to do it for you and it'll go off and do all the work but it you can do this with a phone um, i'm just not going to talk to you through the details of how to do it with a phone i'm going to be talking mainly about digital slr cameras tonight um, the app Star Trails that I just mentioned, you can also, if you put a micro SD card into one of the big adapters and put that in your main camera, you can take all the individual sub exposures and then put that micro SD card into your phone and then stack the pictures together with that. So it's amazing what phones can do now that you can do image processing and stacking and all sorts on a smartphone, which 10 years ago would be completely unheard of. So this is um, a six and a half hour long star trail. 
and you can see that Polaris is here. And when you're pointing at the North Celestial Pole, you have all these concentric rings that are kind of fanning out from the pole star. And the reason for that, you're all astronomers, you know this already, that Earth rotates on its axis once a day. And you will also know that it's not 24 hours, it's 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4.1 seconds to do that. So when the camera is stationary and the stars are moving, what we're actually capturing is the rotation of Earth, not the rotation of the sky. And the fact that there is four minutes difference each day is what gives rise to the different constellations. And I do this talk to camera clubs who have no astronomy knowledge. So I have this slide in there. You guys will already know all about that. But if we were lucky enough to have 24 hours of darkness, those star trails would form complete circles. And it's absolutely on my bucket list to replicate this image. Um, I doubt very much I'm ever going to go to the North and South Poles, but I have a bit of an ongoing project now to image star trails from the exact same spot in my garden several times throughout the year, then in theory stack them all together and get a full circle star trails. It's not going well so far, but I, I have a plan and I'm definitely determined I'm going to achieve this in the, the cheats way rather than just doing a 24 hour long exposure. But those rings will form full circles. And the main thing here, you can see that the arc painted out by the stars is much bigger the further away from the pole star you get. And that is something else that you can use to your advantage if time is limited for you. Now, star trails is one of those things that was like literally the first thing I wanted to do when my mum bought me my first digital SLR camera in um, 2002, I think it was. No, it wasn't. It was it was about 10 years ago anyway. It was my 39th birthday and my mum bought me my first one and I was really happy. Waited till I came to Oxfordshire because the skies were much darker. This is the village um, in Mark's house he used to live in in our village and I took these pictures and I was so disappointed and these are not even straight off the camera. These are after quite a bit of processing to get rid of the background light pollution so I was actually really really disappointed with the single shot results. And there are several disadvantages to just putting the camera into bulb setting and just doing a super long um, exposure there. First of all, you're going to need an extremely dark sky. Now, where I live, we are Bortle 4 skies, which is pretty decent for the UK. And that picture was what 20 minutes looked like. And the background is just full of this residual pink light pollution. But also the sky is not black in any direction, no matter where you are on the earth. If you take a long exposure, your picture the background is not black so to get um, stars and a dark background you're really going to struggle using that method because of the problem that you've got with picking up residual light from wherever else it might be leaking into your picture it means you have to set the ISO really low and that means that only the bright stars are going to show up so all the faint ones that you might see ordinarily on a picture you just won't see them at all so there just aren't that many star trails this is the crucial thing for me we live directly on the flight path to oxford airport and i'm i've completely accepted the fact there are always going to be aircraft trails in my images where you guys are up in scotland you might not have as much of a problem but the airspace above oxfordshire is ridiculous and even when i've been in france and done um, photography from astro farm my record was 28 aircraft in a one hour star trail if they're high level ones, sometimes I clone it out, but mostly I just can't be bothered. I don't actually mind the high level ones, but a really low level aircraft flying through the shot will completely destroy it. So if you've been imaging for 45 minutes and then an airplane goes through, that's it. Your imaging run is wrecked. Equally, security lights or insecurity lights, as we like to call them, if one comes on and floods your picture, that's it. Game over. So that's yeah, a disadvantage. So if you take lots of shorter exposures and stack them, you can overcome a lot of those disadvantages. Now, if any of you have done astrophotography and had to go at trying to stack deep sky objects you will know that it can be a bit of a headache but that's not the case with star trails because what you're doing with star trail stacking is not the same as what you're doing with a nebula or a galaxy picture and the app that you free app that I'm going to show you how to use tonight just does such a great job and it is hands down the easiest piece of software that I've ever used so
don't be put off by the word stacking. It's not the same sort of stacking that you will have tried to do if you are doing deep sky imaging. So the fact that you can stack lots of shorter exposures means that you can ramp the ISO up much higher. So that means you're getting loads more stars, um, which is fantastic. And it then means you can produce a much longer star trails picture than you could do if you was doing it in a single shot. And that's also the case. I've got a friend who lives in London that does star trails. He just keeps his exposures really short. And even though there's all that light pollution in London, using this method, you can still create some really nice star trails pictures. And you can just keep going as long as you have a clear sky as well until you start to lose it to cloud or whatever takes over your sky. It might even be dawn at the moment because we only get about an hour of darkness. There are two programs that are free of charge. One is called Star Trails, one is called Star Stacks. I'm going to mostly show you the screenshots tonight with Star Stacks because it's my favourite. I prefer the interface with it. But in terms of time-lapse videos that I'm going to talk about at the end, there are two options and Star Trails, which is the other stacking software, has a built-in video function. So it's very, very simple to use. So I'm going to show you screenshots from the video part of Star Trails, but Star Stacks is definitely my preferred one. The really game-changing thing as far as the stacking goes is that if you are stacking with Star Stacks, if an aircraft flies through one frame or a light comes on or there's a problem with one of your frames, then basically you can just uncheck it and it will omit it from the stack, but it will automatically fill in the gap for you, which is just phenomenal. And the gap filling properties of this software are absolutely fantastic. The other thing that's awesome is that you can then save the cumulative files and that means that you can then make a star trails time lapse rather than just a time lapse of stars moving you actually get a video of the star trails painting out against the background sky so i'll talk you through how to do that at the end so this is the kind of thing i'm talking about um the low flying aircraft here this is pointing north and um, by the way <laughs> we've got a lot of open sky near where we live so you're going to see a lot of our apple and plum trees because there's virtually nothing else in my garden of interest there's one conifer and our fruit trees are pretty much it so i've done them from every conceivable angle in every season of the year so far. The reason I've kept both of these pictures in, both of these pictures were taken from the same part of the garden and they were just the same ISO, same shutter speed. The only difference is that one of them was a cool winter's night and the other one was a summer's evening and the humidity makes a massive difference in how much residual background light you're picking up. So even from the same location in the same area, same moon phase. One night you can do your pictures and they come out pink. Another night you can take them and they come out black like this. So I always do some test shots first just to check what the sky's doing and just make sure that everything's okay in terms of the humidity and moisture level because it can make a big, big difference. But I'm going to talk through settings in a minute. Um, this water tower was a, a disused air base in Upper Hayford, which is about three, four miles from where I live. I loved it. Um, they've knocked it down now, sadly. You're going to see a lot more pictures of this water tower tonight because I've done loads of imaging runs there. To get this angle on this particular night, I had to stand in the middle of a residential street and people wanted to come home at night in their cars, which was really selfish of them. So basically, I ended up with car headlights kind of flooding there's actually one up here as well loads of internal lens reflections as the cars drove past my camera and there was probably six pictures throughout that imaging run that had this problem and i was able to omit that from the stack so they're the sort of problem frames that you can get rid of as long as it's just a few of them so i did a first test with star stacks this is 20 minutes on the bulb method this is 20 minutes with star stacks same camera same lens just shows you it's absolute hands down um winner for using star stacks just the sheer quantity of stars that are visible to you when you use this app it's just brilliant and obviously the obligatory aircraft trail because even on a test shot you have to have at least one <laughs> Now I'm going to go through camera settings. So these slides do have lots of words, but then the majority of the talk after that is about pretty pictures. First things first, you're going to need your camera to be in full manual mode and you need to be in manual focus because in the dark, uh, 
cameras just cannot autofocus. They just don't know what you're trying to do. Stars are so far away that the camera's infrared doesn't have anything to bounce off. And even if it does get one in shot, the next time if you press the button and it tries to redo it, it may well make it go out of focus again. So I always have the camera on manual focus for all of my astrophotography. Um, one thing to bear in mind, all the books will tell you, um, old astrophotography books tell you to set the camera to infinity, but infinity on a digital SLR lens is too far, so obviously you have to take the opportunity to put Buzz Lightyear in there, to infinity and beyond. Apparently, somebody told me this, that, um, I don't know if it's true, but apparently the way that lenses are tested electronically means that they have to go past infinity so that they can dial back and check that the focus works, something like that. I don't know anything about camera lens manufacture. All I know is that particularly with the kit lens, it is a long way off being focused if you go to infinity. So you definitely need to be in manual. Now focusing can be tricky. So what I tend to do is set the camera to a high ISO and a long shutter speed of about 15 seconds. This is not what you're going to shoot the photos with. This is just to kind of, to kind of frame your shot and get your focus right. At the moment, we have um, Saturn and Jupiter in the sky um, in the evenings. And around dawn sort of time, we've got Venus, which is really handy because they're super bright and you can see them quite cl clearly on the back of the camera. But you can also use the moon. Normally, the moon's focus is slightly different than the stars, but for the purposes of star trails, it will work perfectly fine. You, you'll be all right with that. So you point at the bright star or the moon and then use the live view on the back of your camera and zoom in times five and times ten. If the stars are massively out of focus, you will see nothing on the back of the camera, but the closer you get to focus, then the stars will start to appear. The bright stars like Vega, Capella, they're all fine. Archerus, they're quite good for focusing. In the winter, Betelgeuse and um, Rigel, they're very good. In the summer, if you can't get your camera pointing high up enough to get Vega, then just have a go at the planets if they're around um, or the moon as I say that's absolutely fine but if you have problems with vision at night um, I know I, my eyes if they're tired I can't see anything in the dark so one thing you can do is if you know you can do this just take your camera out in the daytime and focus on the most distant object you can see and that will get you very close and that means when you do then point at a bright star you'll be able to see it on the back of the camera and get your focus absolutely spot on and what you're looking for is turning what would be a very faint blurry blob of light into a tiny pinprick and it's amazing how small the stars do look on the back of the camera but the smaller and the tighter the focus the better so that's the way to do it. And if you can do that, you can do absolutely any type of astrophotography because the same principle applies at a telescope. So the focusing is the only difficult thing about this technique. Once you've nailed that, you'll be able to do anything. One thing that when we're doing imaging with telescopes that is quite useful is a Batonoff mask. And the, the kind of grill here, the, the slats will produce a diffraction pattern that gives you, when the thing is in focus, if you point this at a point source, it won't work on the moon. But if you point it at a bright star or a planet, it will give you a diffraction pattern. The middle line here is asymmetric. That means it's not in focus. The one down here, that line has just gone slightly below. What you're looking for is a perfectly symmetrical six-pointed pattern. Sometimes you need to take a, a few seconds exposure to see this clearly, but the smallest size of these, they're designed for telescopes, but the smallest ones that you can buy are about £10. They fit on the front of a digital SLR. So if you're really, really struggling with focusing, this may help you. And if you have one, you can also do creative stuff like this, which when we had in April the Venus and Pleiades conjunction, I took a picture of this with no Batonoff mask and a picture with a Batonoff mask on and blended the two together because I really loved the diffraction pattern on Venus because it was so bright and I didn't like the diffraction pattern on the stars of the Pleiades so this is a composite of two images I did it purely for artistic effect and I know it splits the crowd doing kind of arty stuff like this but a Batonoff mask is really good fun for doing stuff like that 
so that's the focusing once you can do that as i say the rest is is quite simple so always use a remote shutter cable that just plugs in if your camera has it if your camera doesn't have that then you're going to need to utilize a timer delay that does work but it's going to be a bit tedious because you're going to have to stand and press the button for each exposure and if some of my star trails go on for nine hours that would be a long time to stand pressing the button on the camera so if your camera does have a port for one of these the very basic remote shutter cables are about five pounds and they're super simple to use the programmable intervalometers are about 15 pounds you can still use them in the simple way but just the four pound five pound one is absolutely fine and that means you don't have to touch the camera and um, when you're doing star trails photography and pretty much every type of astrophotography you want the f number of your lens to be the lowest that your lens will allow you to go for generally uh, my wide angle lens only goes to f4.5 my kit lens will go down to f3.5 but the fixed 50 mil will go down to f1.8 some of the um, the nice like samyang wide angle lenses will go down to about two and um, the lower the f number the more wide open the iris is within the camera so more photons are going to get onto your camera sensor the downside of that is if you're doing something creative with your favorite garden gnome perhaps in the foreground and you're very close to it having the f number as low as it will go will mean your depth of field is very shallow so if you are doing something with something interesting in the foreground you may need to just compensate a little bit otherwise you can't get both parts of your image in focus to be honest, I have never done star trails with my camera in anything other than f3.5. So I'm going to show you a lot of pictures tonight with stuff in the foreground and it's worked absolutely fine. So don't don't get hung up on this. Just basically try it. And if it doesn't look like it's working, that will probably be the reason why. To get to the, the F button here, it's on the Q menu on Canon cameras and then you just use the um, slider that you normally would use for adjusting the shutter speed to adjust it down. Next, ISO. Now, I always used to do my star trails at ISO 1600, and that's because I've got a dark enough sky. The ISO that you can go to is going to be determined by what your background light levels are like, and moonlight will affect this as well, because obviously the moon is a source of light pollution. So basically, I now always do this at 800. I used to do it at 1600 because I can get away with it. But one of the problems with the ISO being so high is that the stars can get overexposed quite quickly. And with the point sources of light, it's really easy to overexpose them. And if you overexpose something, all the color is gone. And all of the stars are different colors. And that really shows up in photographs. And by going a bit lower on your ISO, you're going to preserve the star color. So basically, I now always do mine at ISO 800, even though I can get away with going higher. If it's a very hot and humid night, ISO 800 may well be giving me a very pink background, but I just use Lightroom to correct that. If you do have a big problem with humidity or light pollution or anything like that, you may need to go down to 400. But generally, I've never had to do anything other than 8 or 1600, and that's absolutely fine. Some cameras can go super high on the ISO. My camera is a very basic, quite old model. The newer models of camera can go to super high ISOs without the noise problem. My digital SLR suffers horrifically with noise at low light, and I'll, you'll see that in the images I show you tonight. One of the things that um, I've learned is that going ISO 1600 will definitely introduce some noise. So that's another the reason for keeping the ISO just a little bit lower. So this is something you'll have to experiment with because the noise varies with temperature, it varies with um, your camera age, it varies with how many times your camera shutter is fired, it varies with just general sky conditions. So this is why test shots is always my mantra. So don't assume that something will work just because it did last time. But generally ISO 800 will probably be fine. 
make sure your camera is set into continuous mode. Um, I, I once turned mine out of continuous mode for some reason and forgot to put it back and I left my camera doing 30 second exposures for two hours, went outside to find out it had taken one 30 second shot and then stopped and I hadn't stayed out long enough to realise that it had stopped. So I basically wasted two hours of not imaging. So I now make sure my camera is never out of continuous shooting and that just means when you leave the remote shutter cable locked in place it would just take picture after picture after picture you never have to touch anything and if that means you can go inside in the warm and leave the camera doing the work then that's fine the shutter speed on the canon cameras is the roller wheel on the front for changing that you um, just basically slide it back and forth i always use 30 seconds you can actually go longer. If you've got the programmable intervalometer, you can set it to do one minute or two minute exposures and just do a sequence of those. I use 30 second shots, partly because that's the longest that you can do when you're not in bulb. So it means you can just use the basic shutter cable without having to program anything. I quite often do star trails out in different locations. The programmable intervalometer has batteries in it and I always opt for the lowest tech solution if I'm taking all my stuff out to a random location because having something else with batteries that could go dull in the cold or whatever, it's extra batteries you've got to carry with you, it's just something else to have to babysit. So I tend to always do star trails with the five quid shutter cable because 30 seconds works absolutely fine. The other reason as well is that if you do have a problem frame that you have to emit from the stack, the software finds it easier to fill a 30 second gap than a one minute gap. So I've, I just find that 30 seconds works for me. It means that I can keep the shutter cable basic. Everything is just easy to to do and I just always do the same so that means when I come to do time-lapse videos I know what frame rate is going to work because I always do 30 second exposures so next thing is turn off the flash especially if you're with other astronomers who have just let their vision get dark adapted um, you will not be popular if your flash goes off that said one of the great things about star stacks is that unlike the other stacking softwares it will never lighten anything beyond the lightest part of one of the images within the the imaging run so what i mean by that normally deep sky stacker will take a nebula picture and take 100 of them and is adding light to light to light to light all the time it's got an additive effect what star stacks does is looks through the whole data set and if a security light has come on and illuminated a tree it can do that 18 times throughout your imaging run. It will never make the Im final image brighter than the brightest single shot was. So if you did this in Deep Sky Stacker, the security light would amplify with each stack and it would just be horrendous, but it doesn't do that. So you can actually use that feature to your advantage because you can do some light painting. So you could technically do one exposure with the flash on, which will kind of light paint the foreground and then the rest of it just leave the flash off and then when you stack them you'll have one Im image with the foreground illuminated you could do it with led colored lights you could do a green one in one picture a red in the other and basically kind of get creative like that um, so generally i find it's better to do it with a torch then you've got more control so generally just don't leave the flash on because you don't want the flash going off when you're trying to do the stars is the main thing foreground for one picture fine but not for the stars also i quite often get people asking me what tracking mount did i use when i did star trails well um if i was tracking i wouldn't have any stars trailing because it'd be tracking at the same speed of the stars so i always kind of laughed and made a bit of a joke about the fact that well why would i track then somebody actually told me that if you've got a star adventurer and you'd set it to be in the southern hemisphere it will make the camera rotate backwards at half the speed of sidereal rate so the stars will be moving one way the camera will also be moving the other way so it kind of cheats it means you can get more star trails in a shorter period of time this is something i still haven't tried it's on my list of things to try and do this summer and i still haven't done it um so 
generally I don't track I just use a static tripod and it works absolutely fine but if you do have a tracking mount you can try that little hack of running it backwards and see if it helps so that's all the camera stuff sorted the only thing you need to now decide is your composition and you get a very different effect if you've got Polaris in your field of view because that's when you get the concentric rings you get a very different view looking north than you do for example looking at the southern skies here where you're looking at the um, celestial equator the star trails there are kind of straight lines rather than circles and if you're pointing with that in like the celestial equator in the middle you basically then end up sometimes seeing the stars bending around towards the south pole as well as bending around towards the north pole and i've got some pictures that show that in a minute so you can kind of decide whether you're going to point north or south or east or west and get a very different looking picture you also need to decide do you want anything in the foreground and if you don't have anything interesting in the foreground at home and you want to go out on location how long are you prepared to sit outside with your camera in the potentially very cold weather and that may help you decide whether you're going to point north because as I mentioned earlier the stars do not move as much in a given period if you're looking at Polaris so if you only have 30 minutes and it's really cold then point your camera south because the stars will move way more in a shorter period so you also just need to decide how long you are willing to sit outside if you are on location and that may be an hour, it may be seven hours, it just depends where you are. And also think about your tripod height because I know when I first started I always had my camera up at eye level but actually you can get some really interesting angles if you drop the camera right down to the ground so that the tripod's really low to the ground and looking up through things. It gives you a very very different kind of perspective so experiment with that as well don't assume your tripod needs to be up at head height now you guys all know how to find polaris but basically doobie and mirac within the plow will point to polaris um it's a common misconception with non-astronomers that polaris is the brightest star in the sky which is why nobody can find it because it isn't it's quite dim and i don't think i'd ever even seen it until i was in my 20s so it's not a particularly bright star at all so you definitely will not see polaris on the back of the camera or through your viewfinder when you're trying to set up your picture so it's a really good idea to kind of have in your mind's eye where polaris is in relation to your field of view and do some test shots and see if you can figure out which one of those stars polaris actually is because you can always crop things to center it a little bit but it's really good to just get the composition right first time just to show you some examples of different lengths of um star trails here this was one hour this was done at astro farm this is the image that has 28 aircraft in it um, I won't leave it on long enough for you to find them all because we'll be here till midnight. But um, this is just kind of having something in the foreground here, just that telegraph pole pointing up to Polaris just kind of makes the image look a bit more interesting. Um, this was after a hefty pruning of our plum tree, Polaris just kind of behind the branch there. This was 70 minutes, so that's a bit longer. Another angle from the trees again, this was between the apple tree and the plum tree in winter. This is a three hour star trail. Oh, I mentioned earlier on about those wide angle lens attachments and how they have flaws. The flaw in them is that when you put one of those fish eye screw on attachments, the focus will be good here, but in the outside regions, the focus is usually atrocious and generally that is not a good thing for astrophotography however if a star is slightly out of focus it looks more colorful so with star trails particularly the ones pointing towards polaris i really like the effect that these stars are not as colorful and they're all really tight and small kind of thin trails and as you get out here they're all chunkier and more colorful and it kind of draws your eye in like you're looking down a tunnel this genuinely looks like you're looking into a cone or something i actually think that's a really nice feature it's like the only time i would think that's a nice feature if i was trying to do milky way photography with this attachment i by the time i'd cropped out the bad bits i'd have less in the picture than if i didn't have the attachment on in the first place and i know because i tried it several times and i now just don't bother but if you don't have a wide angle lens and want to try this just for 15 pounds you can get one of the fisheye attachments and actually make use of this feature and i think it's quite nice
This is a six hour one. Up until recently, this was one of my records, um, a different season because there are still some leaves on the tree here. But again, just having Polaris in association with something else does help to draw your eye in. Uh, this is another conifer you're going to see a lot of tonight because it's the only other thing in our garden that's even remotely interesting. So this is six and a half hours, which was my record up until quite recently when I did nine hours and 10 minutes. And this is the same tree, but just from a slightly different angle. So you can see that even doing one hour still looks really good. You don't have to do nine hours and 10 minutes to get a good star trails, but that just gave you an idea of the different um, different. Um, kind of effects that you get with different lengths of time, mainly seeing how much Polaris actually moves. We always talk about how the fact Polaris never moves, but clearly it does. It moves quite a lot, actually. Um, that, that was actually done with my new 10 mil lens, I think. So you can see that it, it does still have a little bit of a focus issue at the edge, but no, it's fine. Now, I never grow anything up this obelisk because I, I get so bored of imaging the same three trees with my star trails. So I never grow anything up this. So I walk around the garden positioning the obelisk in different places. You have no idea how long it took me to get Polaris in the middle of this barley twist. And it really, and this is one occasion where you can see the, the, the frame here is actually slightly blurry. And that's because it was quite near to my camera. I think I had this on a little table and then my camera down looking up through it so it was a little bit too close and with the f being down at f 3.5 it meant the foreground was a little bit out of focus but you know, it's just interesting having something else in shot now i mentioned that you get a different view this is actually looking to the east this was done at astro farm as well and this has a lot of aircraft in this the, the one hour star trails i showed you earlier was also at astro farm the skies they're very very busy with aircraft but Polaris would be up off the picture up there somewhere and this just shows you you get a very different effect when you look west and similarly when you look east this is our weather station in the garden also lots of aircraft but you can see that the star trails are getting kind of basically straight lines when you get towards a celestial equator here now when you're pointing this direction you don't need to do a two-hour imaging run um, you really don't you can kind of do half an hour and you still get quite a lot of movement so that's absolutely fine now this is sort of this is the weather station again but with my new very wide angle lens and you can see that the star trails are just straight lines here you can just see that they're slightly starting to curve around on the bottom there as if they're looking down towards the south celestial pole and up here is the north celestial pole so if you are somewhere further south than the UK you can really get this effect of the kind of bending around the two poles with the straight star trails in the middle and it's quite an interesting effect to, to try and get. Now this is the water tower I've done the water tower from every conceivable angle it was possible to do the water tower from before they um, knocked it down I'm so gutted it's gone. I really like this picture and the reason I didn't clone out the aircraft trails here is because it just adds quite often with aircraft it adds another layer of movement you've got the movement of the stars there's a bright satellite flare here there's a couple of aircraft that are going in different movements and then this car drove home and went onto their drive so there's a car trail movement in there as well and it just means there's so many interesting things to look at in the picture and obviously I didn't plan to have car headlight trails in that picture but it actually worked out really well in the end so I left it in and you can see that even with the same landmark you can get a completely different effect just by positioning yourself somewhere different you're going to see a lot of this wind turbine tonight as well. Um, I really want to send these pictures to the guys that own this. They, it's a farm about four miles north of here on the way to Banbury. And that they basically there's a footpath outside their farm so I'm not trespassing when I do this but I've kind of done so many imaging runs on this windmill now that it kind of looks like a hang around outside their house every night after dark which might freak them out ever so slightly but they do Airbnb at the barns there and I think these pictures would look really cool on the wall there because we just don't see many of these wind turbines around here so I really like it but a very different effect by just positioning yourself somewhere different there. And this is the same wind turbine again. This one didn't work out too well. This was the, this is on the main Banbury road and the main Banbury road basically has, this was at 
one o'clock in the morning on a Sunday and it was absolutely heaving with lorries and my camera was just the road is kind of over here and my camera was just pointing ever so slightly too much towards the stream of traffic so there's all of this bleaching and lens effects and just all sorts of nastiness there but that picture didn't work out for me as a star trails but as a happy accident I just realized that it was perfectly capturing the Milky Way so I actually got one of my favorite Milky Way shots even though it's actually too long an exposure really for the Milky Way the stars have trailed normally I would never do a 30 second shot for the Milky Way but it worked really well and I love this picture and it's one of my most popular photo cards um, whenever I sell them at talks so it just did work out I love this windmill in silhouette but it's so rare to get it in silhouette because it's such a busy road so I don't bother blending it in with the other shots I, I just leave it illuminated but I do particularly like that shot so you don't always get the one you're going for and this is our village church and I hate this picture so much it just didn't work for me it wasn't what I had in my head so um just yeah I'll show you in a minute what I did to just as a bit of fun with that picture what I didn't like about it is the sodium street light and it just made everything look really orangey and grainy um, in Oxfordshire we're very landlocked there's hardly any water around here unless it's winter when everywhere floods but otherwise we've got the canal and that's pretty much it but if you live anywhere or are ever on holiday anywhere that has water like this is the Lake District my friend Stephen Cheatley took this picture stars reflect in water and even in a puddle I've taken pictures of Orion um, reflected in a puddle in a field um, if you are anywhere that has a body of water that is quite still and you do star trails they will reflect in the water and it makes for a really stunning shot and I've seen so many gorgeous pictures of um, the comet Neowise reflected in water as well You'll notice here that these look slightly oval. That's because this is an extremely wide angle lens that Stephen used and you get distortion around the outside edges with these wide angle lenses. I've, um, I've noticed that I get this with my wide angle lens as well. If Polaris is up near the top, if it's within the middle region here, it doesn't get affected by it. But when it's out at the extremities, it starts to form this oval shape. And that's just lens distortion. The, the trails are circular. The, the stars haven't warped there. That is just a, a lens effect. Now, really, really important is to make sure your tripod is firmly anchored. Now I mentioned just now the the Banbury Road and the lorries. One of the things I hadn't allowed for when I did my imaging runs at the windmill is that every time a lorry goes past a narrow footpath at 60 miles an hour it creates a lot of wind and every time lorries went past really fast because they all speed along there it's a 60 limit but they're all going way faster than that because there's a dual carriageway a mile ahead so they all hoof it on that stretch and my tripod was wobbling something crazy and I was there for two hours and I only ever got about a 45 minute star trail out of it because every time the tripod shook with the wind it meant that it moved slightly so the trails didn't line up anymore when they stacked so it's so devastating to be there for that long and then have to ditch most of your data um, this, these are my cats. You saw um, this cat Evie at the beginning. If you was in early, she, she likes to be near us. Slinky really loves being near daddy. And if that means climbing on the observatory roof when we're imaging, then so be it. The cats are very social and they love headbutting tripods. And my cats follow me out into the field in a thunderstorm. They are just so ridiculous. And they headbutt the tripod all the time. So if it's crucial that your tripod doesn't move, keep dogs away, try and keep cats away, badgers, whatever pets you happen to have. Pets are a nightmare when you're trying to do long exposure photos. And if you are somewhere that is very breezy drop the tripod down to a lower level because it's not as likely to blow in the wind if it's low down and um, also if you are um, if you have something heavy there you can hang it off the hook so that you can keep the tripod nice and still when you're taking the images but yeah keeping the cats away is definitely an uphill struggle for us <laughs> as I said if I lock them in a room they tear the carpets up um, so yeah, hang something heavy from the hook. Now I mentioned before about dew. 
Dew is not just a problem in the winter. I actually have more problem with lenses fogging up in the summer months than I do in winter because it's usually quite humid. And being warm doesn't necessarily help either because at Astro Farm, the last time we were there, every five minutes, all of our lenses were fogging up. It was an absolute nightmare. So what I do is a light, very lightweight, low cost, um, easy tech solution is to make one out of these hand warmers. Now, because I perpetually have cold hands and feet, my family buy me reusable hand warmers every Christmas and you can get them from Poundland. They're just the re reusable ones. You activate it by kind of wiggling the metal thing inside an exothermic reaction takes place. It turns from a liquid into a solid and stays hot for a, a good while. The important thing with dew heaters is that you don't necessarily need them to be hot all you need is that the lens is warmer than the dew point and even in the depth of winter I've managed to using two of these tucked into a sock I've ended up being able to image for a good two and a half hours with just one set of hand warmers make sure the edge of the sock doesn't stick over your lens because sock vignetting is not very nice um, but there, it's a really low cost, low tech solution. Just cut the end off the sock, stick the reusable hand warmers in. Once they've cooled down, you just put them in a pan of boiling water for a few minutes and melt them again. And then when they cool, they're ready to be reused again. And so, yeah, low cost, very low tech solution. As an alternative, if you're going to be doing it for a really long time, it's pretty much impossible to swap the hand warmers out of your sock without knocking your focus or your camera. Mark um, made me a dew band here. This is basically duct tape and nichrome resistance wire and a little dimmer switch. There are um, formulae online that you can use to calculate how long you've got to wiggle the wire. If the wire isn't quite long enough, it will get too hot and that will melt your camera. So that's not what we're going for. So it's important you have the correct length of nichrome wire for the power supply that you're using. I then just made this felt bag with a bit of Velcro on it. And then I plug this into our power tank that we used to power the observatory with or, or if we're out on location or doing outreach or whatever this is what you can power a telescope mount with but this will power this tube heater I never have it up this high by the way it's usually only halfway through and that will run for nine hours with battery left so it's absolutely fine this is quite useful for hanging the power tank off the hook underneath the tripod so you can kind of make it dual purpose. But if I'm going off out into some random field or to somebody, somebody's house because they've got a wind turbine, I don't want to be lugging all this heavy stuff around. My back is terrible. I can't carry heavy things everywhere. So I only use this at home. If I'm out on location, I just use the sock and the hand warmers. So everyone will always tell you with astrophotography to shoot in RAW, but for star trails, JPEG is fine. And I know this is a, a bit of a contentious point, and most people will say you should never shoot in JPEG. But the thing is, if you're going to be doing nine-hour star trails, you've basically got a lot of pictures. And if you shoot them in RAW, star stacks can't read CR2 files, so you then have to convert them to TIFFs. Every time a CR2 file is about 15 megabytes, when you convert it into a TIFF, it becomes about 60 megabytes. So you then have, I've in the past had 1600 pictures that I've turned into a star trail. If each of those was 60 megabytes, you're very quickly filling up disk space, memory cards, portable hard drives, plus your laptop can struggle with processing that. Um, I only have a, a fairly low cost laptop. I don't have anything fancy. So unless this is something I know I'm going to get printed in a really big format, I just use JPEG and I've honestly never seen that big a difference. So if you do want to make a difference while you're shooting in JPEGs, you can add dark calibration frames. You can do this in RAW as well, but it doesn't matter. What dark calibration frames will do is remove some of the signal noise from the camera, the dark signal noise. And as I mentioned earlier, dark noise is actually um, variable by temperature. So in the summer when it's warm, you tend to get much more noise, particularly in the low cost cameras like mine. So dark frames are really good but as well as the noise they also get rid of hot and cold pixels which is so useful and um, hot and cold pixels are something I spend half of my life cloning out of single shots so what dark frames do is basically remove um, hot pixels and dark signal noise and the way that you do that is you just 
keep everything the same on your camera but put the lens cap on and just take 20 shots the same and what that's doing is taking pictures of nothing but it's capturing the dark noise when you look at it on the back of the camera or on a laptop screen it will just look like a black rectangle with nothing on it but if you stretch it you'll see where all the noise is and what the software will then do is make um, an average and create a kind of master dark and that will basically get rid of the correct level of noise now because these are temperature dependent your dark frames do need to be shot at the same time as your imaging run otherwise you could be subtracting the wrong amount of noise from your picture and it'll just make it worse I rarely do this mostly because I keep forgetting to do it and then I'm processing and I get all the hot pixels and I'm kicking myself it's a good habit to get into but if you've never done this before don't worry about dark frames just practice doing the pictures practice stacking them worry about darks when you get a bit more confident about what you're doing all the detail on how to do this is in the summary notes which I'll email out afterwards so don't worry about that yet if you've never done this um, the other reason I love star trails, apart from the fact they're nice and easy to do, is that they're also so simple to process. I, I seem to spend half of my life processing data. I spend way more hours processing data than I do capturing it with astrophotography. But with star trails, it needs absolutely minimal processing. So you don't need to be using Photoshop or PixInsight or anything like that. Um, the one thing you will need to do, as I mentioned, is if you're shooting in RAW, you're going to have to batch convert all of your pictures into TIFFs. And you can do that with Faststone Image Viewer, Lightroom, um, Digital Photo Professional, Camera RAW. All of these softwares have the ability to do that. And it can do them all as a batch as well. If you're going to be making a time lapse video, you will need to pre process them if there are problems in the image, like noise or a lot of light pollution. I'll talk about that when we do the video bit. Then all you do is basically import and press stack and then just make sure to uncheck any problem frames that you've got. And then if you're going to make a video, you save the cumulative files. And that is pretty much all there is to that part of it. Once you've stacked it, all that you need to do with the image is to just tweak the color balance possibly and the saturation. Do a bit of denoising if your camera is like mine, that sort of entry level camera, and then crop if um, you want to. That's all that needs to be done. Actually, a lot of my star trails would have been fine left well alone, but I'm a serial processor, so I'm always fiddling with my pictures. There is a function in StarStacks called Comet Mode, and this is just a side by side comparison to show you what that does. It basically fades the trails out, so it allegedly looks like comets. Um, it's a bit weird. I think it actually ruins it. To, to be honest, I don't like it very much. I have seen it done well. Um, generally, it truncates the trail as well, so you can do a really long star trail, and it'll only show about an hour of it because it's faded it out so much. I, it's just not something that I find particularly appealing, but if you do like the more artistic stuff, then that is what Comet Mode is. So just wanted to show you a picture, then you knew what that was. So now there are some screenshots using StarStacks, and there are pictures of this in the PDF as well. The reason I like Star Stacks is so that you can drag and drop. Um, with Star Trails, you have to do file open, which is not a problem, but drag and drop is just kind of the, the done thing, really. So that's what I do. So select all the images that you want to stack, drag and drop into Star Stacks. Um, then that is the list of all of your pictures. Now have a look through first because it's quicker to scroll through in a proper editor than doing it in here. Just if there's one of them that has a low flying aircraft or there's a problem in it like a light or something that you don't want, just untick it from the list and then it won't put it in um, the stack. Um, so that's how you omit them. <coughs> Excuse me. You want to make sure that you are in the gap filling blending mode and that is where comet mode is if you want to do that then if you're going to make a video check the cumulative file saving box there and i'll talk about what that means in a second and that's it you just press the stack oh sorry that's the dark button if so if you have shot darks you just click there and then open your dark frames and then press stack and it does it all for you and it builds it in real time so you can sit and watch it um, growing, which is quite cool. Once you've done that, you just hit save <coughs> and then that's it. You've got your picture. 
So it's that easy. I resisted learning how to use this for so long because I was getting really overwhelmed with learning Registacks and Autostacker and Deep Sky Stacker. And I was just, everyone kept saying to me, oh, you need to use Star Stacks. And I just literally couldn't cope with trying to figure out anything else. And then I was really kicking myself because it's so easy to use. And I just could have been doing Star Trails years ago if I'd known. But that's why I'm here telling you how to do it. So in terms of image processing, as I've mentioned, you can increase um, just some basic processing needed here. You can increase the contrast to darken the background, excuse me, and brighten the stars. If you go too heavy with that, though, the contrast becomes really stark between the two. And it actually makes it quite unpleasant to look at. It's quite harsh on the eyes. So I tend to go quite careful with the contrast. If you do have any background light pollution and your picture looks pink, just cool it down a little bit, put the colour balance over to the um, blue, but a little bit more towards the blue, and then it will just balance that out a little bit. You can then increase the saturation a bit to bring out the star colour as well, and that looks quite pretty. And then just apply some noise reduction. And actually for doing all of this, Fast Stone Image Viewer is my favourite. It's free of charge, it's fantastic, and in my opinion has the best noise reduction function of any processing software that I've used and I've used a lot um, so I really like Fast Stone for that and then get creative with cropping I know a lot of photographers will say oh you should never crop an image you should always just have the composition right in the first place I disagree I think it's really fun to just shoot star trails as wide as possible and then you can get some very different effects by just cropping certain areas of it and you can do that as many times as you want you can just get very very creative with it so here are some before and after pictures to just show you the impact of processing now these were the pictures pictures I showed you before that had the lens flare from car headlights this was the final result toned down a little bit I was gutted when I got there that night because there was a lot of development going on on the site at the time and they put eight different kind of um, freestanding sodium lights around the base of the tower so everything was so orange and it just looked so ugly but I've managed to tone that down a little bit and just blend the background a little bit as well one thing to note about the background is if you, you can still do star trails when the moon is up which you know is a problem normally for astrophotography you will need to turn the ISO down a bit if the moon is very bright but one thing that it does do is give you a bluish tinge to the background which I think is gorgeous so actually doing star trails when there's moonlight around is really pretty and it gives you a nice result and that was the case this night there was a moon around that night and a little bit of this was me cooling the picture down to counteract some of this but I think the blue looks really nice um, if you don't like blue you won't agree with me but I actually quite like blue on star trails and this picture this was the windmill on the busy road with all the lorries and I hadn't accounted for the fact that this tree was shaking like crazy every time anything drove past it so I actually cropped that out because it looked awful the other thing I wanted to point out as well here is you can see that there is thin cloud here. I don't think I have ever done a Star Trails picture. I've done hundreds and I don't think I've ever successfully done one without thin cloud coming through the shot at some point. As long as the cloud is relatively thin, the stars will still shine through. And the reason being the cloud is not static, it's actually moving through the image and the stars are moving through the whole time. So that this cloud wasn't covering that whole area the whole time. It was kind of moving along as the stars were moving as well. So keep going. If there's thin cloud, don't worry. Just keep going and then stack it and see how it looks. And yeah, it's not ideal. I don't particularly love the fact that you've got these streaks of cloud in the picture, but it's better than no picture. So I, I just go with it, even if there is thin cloud. Sometimes you can just omit the like the beginning or the end of an imaging run if the cloud gets too thick but thin cloud just don't worry about it um, these are just different crops again of this one because I didn't like this roof here so I kind of did a bit of cropping and cloned out this satellite trail as well the other thing that I did is because it was this is a wind turbine and it was windy the blades were moving so what I also did with this picture once I'd cropped all that stuff out is I blended this with one of the, the single shots where the blades were stationary and used a layer mask in Photoshop so that the blades are not as 
it's not perfectly done because my photoshop skills are not the best but that is something that you can do if you wanted to blend something with one of your single shots but it looks fine without it, it really does it's it's just kind of me just playing because i like fiddling around with this stuff this again there was something here I, this was taken in st ives and um just the alleyway outside where we were on holiday last year and just there was something here just like a little veranda roof just caught in the corner which was spoiling the image a little bit so i just cropped that out as well i wish i'd centered this better but i quite like the spiky plant in the foreground this is what i was talking about earlier about light painting on one exposure here i put my torch on this tree and took a photograph so there's only one picture in the entire stack that has this in it and usually to be honest my trees get light painted by neighboring security lights anyway whether i want it to or not um which is what happened here that's why these bits here are illuminated but yeah it just shows you the effect of having a foreground illuminated or in silhouette i actually really like both um I tend to make two versions of everything and then I share both online anyway because I can't pick between them but it's just fun to experiment and get the different effects. Now because um, I never know whether I'm going to want something to be monochrome or not I always shoot in colour and the reason I shoot in colour is because if I want to make it monochrome afterwards I can do but if I've shot in black and white you can't then make it colour again not very easily anyway so I always always shoot in colour and if I have an incident like this one where I had all this orange light that I didn't like I actually found I preferred the monochrome version and it's really interesting because the one I prefer here is the monochrome but my friends and family all prefer the colour one and actually as time's gone on this has grown on me I really hated it at first because I was so disappointed that it looked so orange and I just wasn't happy it wasn't the shot I had in my head but I quite often create monochrome versions of lots of my pictures this is a before and after processing there was moonlight here there is also a lot of street light in this village leds as you can see from the bottom which are a nightmare for astrophotography but making that more blue just kind of adds to the clarity and it, it's a nice contrast against the beigey yellow um, bit there which i did tone down i used the adjustment brush in lightroom and toned the color saturation down a smidge on this so it wasn't so orange this is just a crop of this and it looks like it was a completely different imaging time the, even though the star trails are the same angle it just has a very different feel with that crop so you can just do that again fiddling around with color and monochrome i like this because it's really moody and looks very old but i like this because the car headlights are red so yet again i like both of them for different reasons now this is the raw picture of the first time I did this wind turbine star trails and as you can see I really hated this tree being all blurred. I also hated the telegraph wires here. The telegraph pole is actually behind this tree and so I actually cloned that out and then I made a black and white version and a sepia version and I really love all three of these and I think on this occasion I did think it was worth the effort to clone out that telegraph wire but it would have still been fine without and fast stone's really good for that you don't have to use photoshop again just a very different feel by having it sepia rather than black and white now i tried my best to like this picture and i still hate it i've tried to do many things and i think the only thing for it is to go back and shoot it on another occasion but just to try and i, I tried black and white i've tried sepia i just don't like it and i'm never going to like it and i really do need to go back and do another imaging run there and try again but just for a bit of fun in photoshop i made a super moon picture and i'm this is a milky way shot that was taken years ago that was 30 times three minutes i think so it's the most detailed milky way shot i've ever taken and i just made some digital art out of it and sadly if i shared these online they would probably get more likes than a genuine astro photo which is really sad but um yeah if all else fails just make a fake supermoon picture out of it <laughs> so this is um 
the picture here that is like quite I, think, I can't remember how many hours this one was I think this was the three hour one and it's quite a wide angle but I mentioned before you can get creative with cropping now on the original picture Polaris is pretty much bang in the middle and I've made it here so that if you do any other sorts of photography, you'll be aware of the rule of thirds, where having your focal point is on the kind of intersection of the thirds parts of your picture. So this is right on the thirds line here and here. So making Polaris sit there gives a different feel. Making it sit in the upper thirds on the left, different feel again. And when you crop like this, you could even take this further and crop out kind of down here. This then gives you the feel of a star trail that's been shot by pointing west. And this is kind of the effect of pointing east. And you can just get very, very creative with your cropping if you've done it really wide like that. Polaris still in the middle, but on the upper thirds line or the lower thirds line, or even do a kind of panoramic crop of it and all of them give you a really different feel all from one image so I think it's quite cool to just crop and have a play around. Um, this was just another example of a black and white picture where I've had something in the foreground that made it interesting. This is the framework for our observatory roof and more trees, the same trees, but with, from a different angle. And this is the observatory shed again. This is our view north. We're very lucky to have so much sky. And on this occasion, I didn't want anything in the foreground. I just wanted all of this sky. And I just seeing the stars coming up above the hill and the trees here, I think is really pretty. And you saw that one earlier. There's this, um, the, a tree again, and that's the greenhouse roof. So these are all processed. Now this is the Coast Guard station at St. Ives from a holiday we had about five or six years ago. I did this at twilight and um, so I started the imaging run before it had fully gone dark and because I was pointing north the stars didn't move. I only had about 20 minutes, 15-20 minutes because we we're on holiday. I didn't want to stand out there all night. We needed to go off and have dinner and drink beer. So um, I just did a short imaging run and that's why the sky is so bright here because it wasn't fully dark when I started shooting but it just shows you you can still pick up star trails even when it isn't fully dark and um, these are just whizzing through some more examples there now this time lapse i've always hated this is really showing the limitation of the canon 1100d when you're in rural france in a very hot and humid summer um, I, one of the shots I had in my mind before we visited Astro Farm at that time of year was getting the Milky Way rising because part of the Milky Way is visible earlier in the year and more of it is visible from there than it is from the UK. So I took lots of pictures just back to back. Um, I think there were 20 second exposures and I made a time lapse video of it and I hate it because it's so noisy and just grainy and is really showing the limitations of my camera. So anytime I ever do time lapse videos like this that consist of still frames, I always put them into star stacks. If ever the camera has been still in one position taking a sequence of pictures I always stack it to see what happens and what you get is a lot of stars because the Milky Way is teeming with stars and it's also very colorful and this is where you can see the stars starting to bend around to the southern celestial pole around the northern celestial pole up there and straight lines bang in the middle so it's always worth just stacking stuff this is from a couple of years ago um noctilucent clouds we have a lovely noctilucent cloud um location um just outside our village it's a really good northern view i've photographed aurora from this field a few times and yeah, basically I was taking pictures here that were 15 seconds gap between them because when I time lapse and I'm taking short exposures, you end up with 30,000 pictures in no time. So these pictures actually had a 15 second gap in between them and Star Stacks handles that perfectly. It just fills the gaps in without any problem. And actually having the star trails and the noctilucent clouds just looks really pretty. This was another noctilucent cloud star trails that I'd done. And then this is from a couple of nights ago. This is Comet um, Neowise. Um, this is one of the brightest not to lucent cloud displays I've ever seen. This was on the early hours of the 11th of July. It was absolutely breathtaking. And this is the comet and the not to lucent clouds is a shot I had in my head ever since I found out this comet was going to be in the north. 
I shot a time lapse of the noctilucent clouds and the comet. And so earlier on today, I just put them into star stacks to see what happened. Now, in the original, the comet is also a trail that's really long here. So what I did is I stacked it and then I blended it in with a single shot. So the comet is stationary. So it's a composite of two images blended together. And the, the noctilucent clouds are all a bit sort of blurry because noctilucent clouds are not a stationary object either. But again, it's a very interesting effect that you can get. So it's always worth just sticking stuff in star stacks to see what you get. Now, Midsummer's Night 2015, Mike and I had this incredible aurora display from Oxfordshire. People north of Birmingham couldn't see it because it doesn't get dark enough that far north. We were so lucky. We had an hour and a half of the sky literally dancing with aurora. It, it, I was crying. It was just so amazing to see this visually as well as pick it up on camera. And because I time-lapsed that, I just stuck those in star stacks. So I've got stacked aurora pillars and star trails. So definitely worth playing around with and if you want to get super creative this is the long exposure that I showed you earlier on the three hour star trail paint shop pro has some really trippy effects that you can apply to pictures and these are very dali-esque so you can get super super crazy with it and just make some interesting artwork out of it digitally so that's all the stuff about taking pictures. A lot of information there I know, but I'm going to show you now how you can use those pictures to then go on and create a video. Now, as I mentioned before, if you want to do this, you need to tick this box that says save cumulative file. And it will then save it in another folder. If you just take your 30 second shots and turn it into a video, you will get this. So this is great. It's really fun. You can see the stars moving and all that stuff, but that isn't a star trails. What the cumulative process does is it will take your second image and blend it with the first one and save a copy. Then it will take the third one, add, add it to the stack, save a copy. And each time it saves it, the star trails getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So you end up with all the same number of images again, but each time the star trails are getting longer and longer and longer on each one. So if you then make a video with those images rather than the one straight off the camera, you get this effect, which I love. And it's the only way that you can do this. Now, the, the big flaw in this is that because this is a cumulative process rather than a live video, if a security light comes on and illuminates a tree, the tree will then be lit. The, that's it. The tree's lit forever for the rest of the video. An aircraft will fly through, the, vape, the contrail or the lights trail will stay there for the rest of the video. And if cloud moves through equally, you will see that moving through and it will stay there for the rest of the video as well. So that is because it's the cumulative process, but you just have to take that in order to get the star trails effect. So I mentioned before star trails. Um, I've got an old version of this at the moment, but it has a video function in it. And so you just in that dialog there, just click the open button and the interface on this is very, very basic. You can't do drag and drop. So you have to just kind of go with the file open dialog and then open all of your cumulative images, which I suggest you save in a separate folder first because you don't want to mix them up with your non cumulative ones. Um, <laughs> Starstacks gives these an incredibly long file name, so I tend to rename them as well because the, the file names are so long that the computer sometimes struggles. So you do file open, open your cumulative files, and then in that box again, click on the little video icon, camcorder icon. What it will then do is bring up this box. If you leave the output frame size the same as it is raw, like 4,000 and odd pixels that you get full size on a standard um, crop frame SLR, your video will be absolutely huge. It will be so big that your laptop probably won't be able to play it. So I resize my frames usually to around about 1280 or thereabouts. And yes, that will degrade the image quality slightly, but otherwise the pictures are just gonna, the video sizes are gonna be huge. I generally use 15, um, frame, 15 frames per second frame rate, and then you tell it which output folder to put it in, type your file name in, and then click OK. 
So yeah, that's that video up close. So if you have taken 30 second shots and you do 15 frames per second, because each one is 30 seconds, it means one hour of star trails here then becomes an eight second video. So you can see that you have to do a lot of imaging in order to get a long video. You can make it a slower frame rate than that, but I find it can be a little bit jerky. I rarely go below 10 frames per second. If anything, I tend to speed it up because I do do quite long exposure ones. Eight seconds is about the average concentration span of teenagers in my house but um, generally I like a longer video but it just gives you an idea an hour's worth will be a short video so you do need to do longer imaging runs for videos. Um, I don't often use uh, star trails anymore to make my videos what I tend to use is pip now pip is a free app um, all the download links are in the notes that I'll send you for this don't be put off by how complicated this program looks because you can do some very basic steps here to make a video so you just drag and drop your images into pip and it will come up and tell you that it's using join mode because it's got lots of pictures in one data set so that's fine what you then do is move into the processing options tab up here. Make sure you haven't clicked the convert color to monochrome because you want to make sure your images stay colored. And again, to resize the frames, I, I now actually go down to 750 because even then the videos are quite big. So click on resize frames, keep original aspect ratio because you want to make sure it keeps the 3 2 ratio on the picture. 750 pixels, or whichever, you can do them more than that if you're computer can handle large files, mine can't. Then go into the quality options. This program is designed for pre-processing planetary videos that you then go on to stack. So if you check this, it will sort your video frame by frame in what it thinks is the best quality order. We absolutely don't want it to do that because otherwise your pictures will be in the wrong order and you won't get a star trail sequence. So make sure that box isn't checked. It shouldn't be, but just make sure it isn't just in case because that will ruin your video. You then want to make sure that the frames are played in forward order. And if you want to also you can click here and just tell it to pause just for maybe 15 frames just so that the end of the video it holds the last frame for if it's a 15 frame per second video then it will hold it for one second if you keep 15 in this box so it just makes the video not end quite so abruptly and I think it looks a little bit nicer so I tend to do 20 frames to pause it by thereabouts something like that and Output, you want to tell it to give you an AVI at the end because you want a video. And over here is your frame rate. So anywhere between 10, 15, 20, thereabouts. If you've done a 12 hour one, you can go even higher and do 30 or 40. This will default to 60 frames per second, which takes about half a second of video when you've only done a short imaging run. So 15 frames per second is absolutely fine for that. Then in the do processing tab, just click on the start processing button and it will do it and it will create the video. The video output there is an AVI, which will still be really big, even if you've resized it to 750. So I then tend to do some more processing using Windows Movie Maker, but you can use any movie editing software. Most phones and tablets have something that you can do this with. But I, Movie Maker 10 is a free app and it's actually really good. Now I've got my head around it, I quite like it. So you just create a new project and click Add Clip and click on Photo or Video and just open, it will open the file open box here and just click on the video, whichever one it is, whatever you've called it, your previous one, and click open. So just select your video and click open. Now, because this is an AVI that's been done in PIP, Movie Maker is going to tell you that it doesn't have a support, a, a, it's got an unsupported video codec. It's not a problem. The software can transcode that for you if it needs to. So just click on that button there and it will do that for you. So you'll then have the video in movie maker you can go over here to more tools and you can click on edit video there which will then take you into this bit where you can then change that this has got the speed here so if this has got a drop down menu and you can select the speed that you want from there and 
once you've decided you can do times 0.5, 0.75 times 1 times 2 times 4 times 8 I think are the options I think you can even go up as 16 times speed if you want to go super super speedy um, and then once you've decided on that you just click OK you can preview it here you can move the little slider over and click press play and it will preview the speed that your video is going to play at and then once you've done that you can basically save the video at this point if you want to or you can add another clip I tend to add my little kind of business card at the end of all my videos so you can add an, add an end screen or you can even put multiple videos together and over here you can change the transition so it will blur as you, or swirl round or whatever you want it to do. You can get as complex as you want with Movie Maker or you can keep it super, super simple and it works perfectly well. You can even add music so you can edit soundtrack and then just this, using these um, sliders here you can basically insert music from your local files or there are some built-in music tracks as well and once you've done that you just click on save video make your movie and then it will go ahead and make an mp4 video for you it will still be quite a big file size but it will be a more manageable file size than the avi that came out of pip so that's great and it will say it will be mp4 the free version doesn't really give you much choice on this slider that is just what it defaults to and I've never found that that makes too much of a difference so once you've um, got used to doing that you can also do some strange effects where this is using um, star stacks you can get the cumulative files and then kind of reverse the order of them and then put them alongside each other so it paints out the star trails and then starts to unpaint itself again so that's quite a cool thing you can do the other thing you can do is to make it paint them out and then bounce and literally move backwards and undo itself which is really trippy because the lights will then turn themselves off again and the airplanes will fly backwards out of the shot again but that's something you can do if you want to get creative and do some crazy stuff like that. You can do a bit of both if you want to as well. Now I'm going to finish with um, a little compilation video to just show you some of the videos that I've done so far. It's quite a long video, so just sit back and enjoy it. But before I do that, I want to just show you some other uses for Star Stacks because it's different than the other stacking softwares that you get. You can actually utilize it for lots of different things that you wouldn't be able to use Deep Sky Stacker for. This is, um, we went to Glendo State Park in 2017 for our honeymoon to see the solar eclipse and we had four digital SLR cameras and three bridge cameras, four phone cameras all doing stuff but one of my cameras was doing a wide field thing where it took a photograph every five minutes throughout the entire eclipse. During totality it took 2,000 photographs because I wanted to get all of it and then carried on taking one every five minutes until the entire event had finished. And using star stacks to stack these together, because the camera's been in one place, it was super easy to do. I just chose the three out of this section to include in the stack, where I got the two diamond rings and the, the kind of corona just there, the whole ring around the sun. And it does it all for you, and it's so much easier than trying to do it with um, Photoshop. It's just way, way simpler. And you use exactly the same principle, drag and drop, and then click stack, and that's all you need to do. So it's really good for that. This was a lunar eclipse. My camera got knocked here when I changed the batteries, but this was an entire lunar eclipse from 2015, um, which I used Star Stacks for. ISS Transit, my first solar transit of, um, with the ISS was last July, I think it was. And I used Star Stacks once I'd extracted the still frames from my video, I stacked them all together with Star Stacks. Did the same thing with an ISS Transit of the Moon. That one's a bit more challenging, but you can just make out that it's the ISS. But I used Star Stacks for that. During meteor showers, you can, uh, if you, I always photograph meteor showers. Um, I usually have two or three cameras running pointing the same direction. Um, I quite often just take the frames that have meteors in them and stack them. So obviously the star trails are jaggy here because there's loads of frames missing. But if you stack all of the frames, it can tend to kind of make the 
meteors disappear a little bit into the background. So this is super noisy. It's not a very pretty picture, but it is still basically a star stacks picture that's got all the Geminids in it from um, 2018. It was a good year for the Geminids. You can take a picture of the setting moon. Um, it doesn't have to be a crescent. It can be a full moon or a any phase of moon really, but if you take pictures a few minutes apart, you can stack them together. Um, same here, this was the moon and Venus last year, just stacked together. And I got a helicopter transiting the moon in January. It was the wolf moon, the full moon rising. So this is my air wolf moon picture. The helicopter, and um, because my camera was in raw at the time, it took forever to save to the card. So I only got three pictures with the helicopter in, but managing to stack those together kind of creates an apocalypse now kind of feel. I use it a lot for fireworks as well. If any of you do photography of fireworks, it's really good fun to stack together different parts because generally you'd have to do a long exposure for this and then you get too much of the kind of trailing of the fireworks so you can take shorter exposures and stack them to keep some of them as like smaller dots so very good fun to play with and lightning I absolutely love lightning photography and if my camera has been pointing in one direction and there's been more than one lightning flash I'll stack them together um, any of you that know me know that I um, have mob mobility problems. My spine has titanium rods in it and screws. I also have a battery pack inserted under the skin with wires going to my spinal cord. And my spinal cord stimulator is what got me out of my wheelchair and walking again. So it's an amazing piece of technology, but I don't know whether it makes me more or less likely to get struck by lightning. So I'm not sure it's wise for me to be out doing lightning photography, but I do it anyway. I don't care. So this was only two images stacked. There was actually two huge bolts in one flash on that particular picture. But this is a seven image stack loads and loads of different lightning here and because this was taken over a period of time the rain has also moved and the gaps in the cloud have moved so it makes for a really artistic shot so yeah star stacks is fantastic for stuff like that so as I mentioned, all the links for downloading all the software are in the PDF with all of the instructions and screenshots and information. So you can follow that through when you next have a clear night if you want to try this out. And as I said, do please email me. So I'll just let you watch this video. Now you can see the contrails here kind of moving through and staying in shot, as I mentioned earlier. That, that's a common feature in all of my star trails. Now that's what I mean about thin cloud. It has made the final video very grainy, but you can still see the stars despite the cloud. So it's worth keep imaging even if it gets cloudy. It gets lighter and lighter as them bigger hair, um, lorries were driving past. This is all security lights that are basically, I've only ever done one um, star trails from my garden where my neighbor's light didn't come on and illuminate my foreground for me. Drives me crazy. I think the foreground being illuminated does look quite cool, but it'd be nicer to have a choice in it and choose myself if I wanted it or not. But uh, you can't seem to talk people out of their security lights. People just are so attached to them.
this is an example of not checking the focus carefully enough so that's why the star trails are a bit fatter there but it does mean it's a bit more colorful you get a very different effect when you look south it, it really is amazing how different the videos look when you're not pointing towards the north I think you've probably noticed I've never done one without cloud coming through. This was a lens reflection here from um, street lights. Couldn't really do much about that. I do miss that water tower. I wish it was still there. I will stop that there because I know I've been talking for absolutely ages. <laughs> so thank you for listening, everybody. I will just turn off screen share and then I will come back and um, stop share. There we go. Okay, I'm trying to find out how to unmute everybody again. I think we can unmute ourselves. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> I can't remember what the shortcut is. Okay, so who do I need to make host again? It's Roy Bryce. Roy, okay. There we go. I can't remember the shortcut to unmute everybody, but... Uh... Again, it was all time the last time I tried <clears> that, didn't work, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some, this seems to be a bit laggy.